Welcome back to our series on multivariable calculus. In this episode, we're going to talk about space curves. We've actually already seen an example of a space curve when we found the vector equation for a line in three dimensions. Now, that vector equation wasn't quite in the correct form to be a space curve, so let's use it as our first example. The equation for a line in 3D started with a particular point that was on the line. I'm going to call that x0, y0, z0. And then it followed up with a vector in the direction of the line. We'll call that vector v, and we'll give it coordinates a, b, c. That gave us the vector form of the equation for a line, which was a vector that went from the origin to the point x0, y0, z0. And then to that, we added the vector v times a parameter. The parameter t, its purpose was to multiply these components of vector v so that we could form all the points along the line. That is, with the appropriate choice of t, the parameter, we could extend v or contract it and even flip it around in the other direction with negative t's and generate every point on the line. So this was the vector equation for every point on the line. Let's take a look at it in the form of a space curve vector, though. What that means is to write each component as a single function, and we can do that pretty easily. If I take x0 plus at, that forms every single x component of the vector that points towards a point on this line. y0 plus bt takes care of the y component, and z0 plus ct takes care of the z component. So this single vector does exactly what the vector equation for a line did. I can go even one step fo further forward and generalize this particular vector function by saying any function in the form of a parametric equation for the x component, which we'll call f of t, followed by a parametric equation for the y component, which we'll call g of t, and that followed by a parametric equation in z, which we'll call h of t. Any vector that can be put into this form will form what is called a space curve. And with the appropriate choice of t, we can map out all the points on that curve. Notice how we could do that with an equation for a line, converting the conventional equation into a form that looks like a space curve. All of our space curve functions will basically look like this. And let's take a look at a different example so that we can see how to graph it and represent it. And in particular, look at what we're really interested in doing with these space curves, which is looking at their projections in 3D space. The space curve we're gonna spend some time with is t sine of t, cosine of t. Now, some of you will recognize this. This is the formula for a helix that runs along the x-axis. It's basically a circle that spirals. That is, it's a circle that instead of tracing itself over and over again, it runs in a direction while it traces the circle. So let's take a look at that in 3D space. We're going to have our z-axis, our y-axis, and then coming out at us is our x-axis. Well, this helix is basically what we call a left-handed helix. As I point my thumb in the direction of the x-axis, it doesn't go in the clockwise or counterclockwise direction. It goes in the clockwise direction. So it's a left-handed helix. And here's what the form is going to look like. It's going to start right here on the z-axis, and then it's going to bend its way around while traveling down the x-axis. So it makes, in essence, a spiral or a spring. We can kind of take a look at what t values actually generate this, and then we can start looking at this from different perspectives. First, this represents t equals 0. At t equals 0, of course, we'll be on uh, 0 on the x-axis, so we'll be at this point. We'll be at 0 on the y-axis because sine of 0 is 0, and we'll be at 1 on the z-axis. So that's why that's t equals 0. We're at 1 on the z-axis, and we're within the z-y plane. 
As soon as we move out a little bit though, the next t value I want to look at is pi over 2, and that's going to be right about here, t equals pi over 2. At pi over 2, we're going to have moved down the x-axis by pi over 2, so we'll be forward of the zy-axis, and at the same time, we'll have turned through a quarter of a turn. At pi over 2, the y value will be 1, and the z value will be 0, so that's why we'll be here in the first quadrant of the xy, forward pi over 2, over 1, but within the xy plane. The next point is going to be right underneath here at the bottom of the curve, and that's going to be t equals pi. At t equals pi, we will have turned through a half turn, so we'll be at the bottom of the spiral. We'll be pi forward along the x-axis, will be at zero on the y-axis because the sine of pi is zero, but the cosine of pi is negative one. So we're actually underneath the xy plane. We're down at z equals negative one. And then if we keep going, the next value is going to be right over here. It's going to be at our extreme left edge of the circle, and that's going to be at t equals three pi over two. At 3 pi over 2, we are back to uh, the sine value being 1, so we're going to be at negative 1 on the y-axis. The x value will be 0, so we'll be, uh, or excuse me, the z value will be 0, so we'll be within the uh, xy plane. Uh, it's just we'll be extended over uh, uh, to the left by negative 1 and forward by 3 pi over 2. And then finally, the very top of this, uh, again, extending the uh, x-axis down from t equals 0, this will be t equals 2 pi. And this is where the cycle will begin to repeat itself. So we're at 2 pi on the x-axis, and we're back to 1 on the z and 0 on the y. So we're within the x-z plane. Hopefully you can see that in three dimensions, but it's one of the tricky things about a space curve is sketching them is difficult. Heck, it's hard enough drawing a line in three dimensions or plotting a point and getting an accurate sense of where it falls. You can be forgiven for looking at the graph of a 3D function with curves in it in three dimensions and being a little bit puzzled as to where it goes. One of the ways to help us is what we want to do now is imagine a vision of this particular graph from different perspectives. And hopefully that will help us to overlay it and add depth to what is otherwise a flat drawing that's really representative of 3D. So let's do that. What I want to do first is imagine that we are right here. We're looking back down, that's our eye, looking back down the x-axis at the graph while it's being traced. So what we would see is a horizontal y-axis and a vertical z-axis. So this would be z, y, and the question is, what would we see if we looked in that direction? Well, of course, we wouldn't see anything in the x direction. It's moving straight towards us, so that would be foreshortened up to the ultimate zero. So it's as if this disappears. In other words, we're just going to see a two-dimensional sine in the horizontal and cosine in the vertical. And of course, that's going to produce a circle that varies around one. And basically, it's going to start right here at t equals zero. It's going to move to here at t equals pi over two. It's going to move down to here at t equals 2 pi, or excuse me, pi. It's going to move to here at t equals 3 pi over 2. And at 2 pi, it will be back to its starting point. So in essence, that's where the circular part of the helix comes from. If we look straight down the x-axis, we'll be able to see that as its graph. And we can even see what the graph of this would be by simply blocking off the x component. It's going to be a y component of sine t and a z component of cosine t, uh, the y being horizontal and the z being vertical. Okay. Well, let's then take a second look. Uh, this time, let's look down the positive y-axis. So we're going to put our eye right here, and we're going to look in this direction. So if we look in that direction, we're going to see the x z graph, and the x is actually going to extend off to the left. Those will still be positive values, but it'll extend off to the left in terms of our viewpoint. So this will be the x-axis, and this will be the z-axis. And if we imagine what we will see when we look in this direction, well, let's think about it. In the x-axis, all we're going to get is consecutive increase values of t. So it's simply going to move across like a linear function moving the graph in this direction, but what will it indeed be moving? 
Well, in the z direction, again, that's cosine t. So this will be cosine t versus t. And we've graphed sine and cosine before. Cosine starts at 1 when we're at 0. It moves down to negative 1 and then back up again and returns to its former value. This would be t equals 0. This would be t equals pi over 2. This would be t equals pi. This point here, the other intercept, would be t equals 3 pi over 2. And this point right here where we return to our starting point and start to repeat the cycle, that would be t equals 2 pi. Okay, our third projection will occur if indeed we look straight down the z-axis. So for this third projection, we're going to imagine our eye right up here looking straight down. So the z-axis in this case is going to be foreshortened, and I'm going to see the x-axis stretched out horizontally and the y-axis vertically. Let's see what that would look like. So this would be the x-axis, and this would be the y-axis. We're looking straight down the z-axis. Okay, if we view it from this perspective, again, the starting point is on the z-axis, but it's going to appear to us to be at the origin. Again, if we block off the z, this becomes t versus sine t, or it's just the graph of sine t. So it's going to start at 0. It's going to swoop upward to its maximum value, down to its minimum value, and then back up to its starting position. This will be at t equals 0. This will be at t equals pi over 2. This will be at t equals pi. This will be at t equals 3 pi over 2. And finally, we'll return to our starting point at t equals 2 pi. So while from a three-dimensional standpoint, this helix may be hard to visualize in three dimensions, if we look down the x-axis, this is what we see. If we look down the y-axis, this is what we see. And if we look down the z-axis, this is what we see. So which one of these is the correct graph? Well, the reality is they all are. This is what it would look like from the three different perspectives. This is what it would look like in totality. One of the skills you have to develop when provided with any sort of a space curve is your ability to visualize it and work with it. Now, these sketches can be difficult. Three-dimensional plotters that you can get availability to online are hugely helpful in helping you to visualize this because they'll give you the ability to plot the individual points or even plot the function, and then you can grab a hold of the screen and turn and rotate it so that you can achieve these different projected views all within the same graph of the three-dimensional function. Our job will be moving forward to get more and more comfortable with these space curves defined in terms of parametric functions in x, y, and z. Once you're familiar with these, then we can start applying the rules to calc for calculus to them and finding things that are very much like slopes, finding extrema, and finding areas under curves, which in the case of three-dimensional surfaces tend to produce surface areas and volumes.